I'm Stephen Caranda with Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Joining me here today on Don't Lecture Me is Randy Russell, author of Ghost Cats of the South. Randy, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. It's a pleasure to be here. For someone who's not familiar with this book, how would you describe the, the collection of stories that are in this book? Well, I'm tempted to say it's a quirky book because it was recently uh, uh, titled the quirkiest book of the month in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And I'm, there's such an August newspaper that I thought I would take that to heart. But uh, basically, these stories are about cats and people. And a lot has to do with the relationship, the heart ties between cats and people, which I, I, I think helps create a, a ghost experience. How did you go about collecting these stories? I've been a formal folklorist for 22 or 23 years now. And I began by researching traditional stories, including ghost stories, and visiting the sites and talking to the people who live there. And my first book was Mountain Ghost Stories, and it sat in Appalachia. And as I visited those areas and talked to the locals, they started telling me better stories than the ones I was researching. And I began collecting uh, first-person encounters with the ghost as just a hobby. I'd ask everyone I talked to, have you ever seen a ghost? And most people would say no, but then I said, well, has anyone in your family? And they'd say, yes. So I, I, I've, I began to find out how common an experience it is for a person to encounter a ghost in their life. And some of the stories are quite incredible. And many involve the passing of loved ones. Um, we, I call them comfort visits. When someone dies within a, a recent time, like maybe three or four days, the close family members will often experience a visit by that person uh, which uh, they find comfort in. And how did that sort of this interest in folklore as it's sometimes called in the book ghost lore, how did that then translate into what we've got here now which is about uh, stories of cats and people? Exactly, exactly. I made up ghost lore but I assume someone else has tried it out. Folklore, you know, is a modern term as uh, 1890s, a society that collected uh, the history of folk didn't know what to call what they did and they have all voted and they voted folklore so I consider ghost lore when it's researched through the folklore to, to kind of work. Um, it evolves in, into pets because they are in, in many instances family members and in fact most people might prefer the company of their dog to some of their relatives so um, as I, Ghost Cats of the South is a companion to Ghost Dogs of the South, a book that was published earlier and as I, I talked to people about dogs, they kept saying, well, what about cats? And they would tell me the story about their uh, dead cat or deceased cat. And then I also researched other areas and developed. I, I actually write the stories as stories. Um, a lot of my research is, is first person or primary research, but it's more like a twice told tale, perhaps. Is there something about the South that breeds these sort of folklore and even ghost stories? There are several things about the South that is wonderful for stories. First of all, as, as a folklorist, I believe that history lives in people's houses. And so do the good stories. I, they're not in institutions. And in the South, you're much more likely to be invited to somebody's house than you might, might be elsewhere. The, the respect Southerners show um, a fellow human being often leads to conversation. Uh, rarely can you walk into a room in the South and be uh, left without being greeted and asked how you are. And as you know, when you live here, you ask everyone else how they are. But the conversation and respect, and people want, want to listen when you talk, mainly because they may want to talk too, but I find a lot slower pace in human encounters. You will stand in line at the post office a lot longer in the South. Everyone's going to ask the clerk how her two kids are. Um, and she's going to ask them how, how their kids are doing. And I think that that entire tradition just lends to talking and stories on top of which. Um, I've, I was asked this recently before, why I set my stories in the South. And it is the people as well. I think we have quirky characters in the South. I, I don't know if it's just uh, the small towns. The, I, I don't know why, but we allow characters to be themselves, it seems like to me. We're in, Maybe the job market, it's something as simple as that. You don't have to hide your quirks. People rather accept them uh, as long as they're not too dangerous. But it's just my impression. I, I, 
I think I think you get good stories from uh, quirky people, and they're here. In the stories, these cats often range from good to bad, and the two stories that focus here on Mississippi, the cats are specifically malevolent. Is, is there something specifically <laughs> about I Mississippi? I think so. <laughs> is there something about Mississippi that caused that, or are those just two good uh, stories from the state that were uh, collected? Uh, probably they're two good stories, but uh, I, I divided my stories as I was working on them. I actually was researching about uh, 36 to 40, and I ended up with 22 into bad kitties and good kitties, and I didn't want to do a lot of bad kitties. But I could not escape the association of cats with witches, for instance. And once I crossed that bridge, which, <laughs> which we did quite well by a witch who changes herself into a cat and then back, um, I was able to do a few bad kitties. Um, it was difficult. My ghost dogs of the South as well, I had one or two uh, bad dogs, but I much prefer working with the relationships. So I consider a bad kitty a bad relationship. You mentioned all the stories that you were researching. Was it specifically, or was it especially difficult to choose the ones you wanted to keep? Was it hard to, to get rid of some of them? It is because the potential was there, and I found that I was duplicating is why I, I would lose a story or two. I, have, I came across two or three and had researched one or two that people had told me about cats that appeared at weddings. And I'm just fascinated by that. But you know, once you write about a cat at a wedding, I had to eliminate the other two where uh, a wedding and a cat was involved just to uh, keep a reader from throwing the book against the wall and saying, I just read that. Uh, but otherwise, it had more to do with the duplication. Are there any stories that you particularly like or that ring especially true for you? Uh, I do have a favorite. It's called A Patch of Fog, and it's, it's more or less... It kind of shows, shows the range of the stories as well, because the ghost in A Patch of Fog is actually the ghost of an old woman who, who died in old age. And, and uh, at a small place in the mountains, when people drive through this particular patch... I'm from a place where there's fog all the time. It's the Smoky Mountains. and. Uh, there's fog lifts from the roads, the trees, the rocks, the houses, and it's just always there, especially in the morning. But when you drive through this patch of fog, particularly if you're alone in your car, the patch of fog will come in the window or in the vent, and it, it wants something. It wants you, and it wants your car, and it has, it has a purpose, this ghost, and it, it takes over the driver of the car, and what, what I tell it from the point of view of the driver of the car, who starts taking on the age of an old lady as the ghost occupies her. And she, she goes to a con local convenience store and buys cat food, much to her own surprise. And then gets back in the car and it, it more or less drives her up to an old, old farmhouse way high in the hills where two cats are waiting to be fed. And now, I, I love this story because the time the, the protagonist spends at this house taking care of these cats and feeling feeding the hummingbird, fill, filling the hummingbird feeders and whatnot. Just things she knows to do. She knows where the keys are, of course, because the ghost is with her, uh, are perhaps the best two hours of her life that year. It's just a very pleasant time for her. And then when the uh, cats get to run out a little bit and come back in, she leaves and becomes herself quite quickly again. Now, this is not a, a cat who became a ghost after death, but it is a ghost cat story. And, one I was fond of. What are you really hoping people will take away from this collection of stories? A respect for their cat that they probably already have if they're interested in it. I almost said in every story, almost, and including the Jackson, Mississippi story, I, which is where it may have ended up, but I, I actually, as I was working, I had this sentence almost every story, never kill a cat. And that's what I'd like people to take away from it. The, uh, just that cats are a full spiritual life inside a body, just like we are. Um, I believe that. And I believe it's uh, bad karma and bad juju to do harm to other animals or other people. And I'd like people to like cats just maybe a little bit better. Randy Russell, author of Ghost Cats of the South, thank you so much for talking to me. Oh, today. it was great fun.